Hello everyone, just an update on how my Foreign Legion project is going, it's coming along. Um, before I forget to mention it though, um, in my previous very long uh, video on the subject of wargaming the Foreign Legion of Beaugest, I was talking about the uh, models that were available for Fort Zindana and I mentioned the Sarissa MDF uh, model but um, I discovered afterwards that in fact um, most of the MDF companies uh, not most of them but there are more MDF companies that uh, I'd overlooked that do a model that's perfectly suitable um, for Fort Zindernerf. Um It's just that they don't describe it as Fort Zindernerf, they just describe it as desert fort um, but foreground uh, definitely do one um, theirs comes along with some um, sort of texturing powder which presumably is something along the lines of chinchilla dust um, so um, I would imagine you know it's a bit of a palaver to paint it and uh, um, you know, texture it and so on. So I'm still, I'm still uh, of the opinion that I went the right way by buying my uh, model from Meslo. Um, and Empires at War, which is a sort of lesser known um, MDF company, uh, but I've noticed them quite a bit recently because they do do a lot of uh, relatively cheap Old West stuff, which they sell on um, eBay. But um, Empires at War, they've got a they've got a website you can go to, and you'll find they do a desert fort as well. Um, so other other MDF Fort Zindernerfs are available. Is basically the message. Um, yeah, so uh, coming along quite nicely, as I say. Um, I have now um, I took a little. Um, break from painting the uh, regular kind of infantry to paint these uh, three models here which are all without models um, partly because I I have kind of admired this particular sculpt for a long time and um, it's not actually on uh, the new uh, Grubby Tanks website it's one of those um, sculpts that I was talking about that um, were on the old catalogue uh, without that used to be uh, D4 Legionnaire in Blowers firing over the body of a dead mule um, I just I just like the um, you know it's almost like a little vignette um, and I was very pleased to discover that uh, Andy Grubb has still got the mold um, it's just he hasn't uh, catalogued it yet on his website so if you are keen to get hold of this and, o and other items such as the Hotchkiss machine gun that I mentioned um, just contact him direct and I'm sure he can provide them for you um, I haven't, well, it's far too early yet, far too soon yet to have uh, received the order that uh, I sent off to Castaway Arts in Australia. Um, they did, I mean, the, the, their turnaround was fantastic. They, they, they had them in the postal system uh, within 24 hours, I think, of me placing the order. Um, but unfortunately the COVID situation is really uh, impacting on uh, postal deliveries in Australia uh, and since last, uh, when was it, last Wednesday, um, so, so six for six days um, the parcel has just been sitting in um, Brisbane um, in Queensland, um, cleared for international departure but not actually having departed so um, I reckon it would be about a month I think I think the Australian postal website says wait 15 working days you know for, for deliveries to to the UK 
But the, why I mention that um, is much as I like these without figures and um, you know probably am you know committed to um, continuing to buy them. Um, I am very interested to see what the Castaway Arts Tuareg in particular look like um, because um, you know I'm I'm. I'm content with having slightly different proportioned or scaled models, you know, if it's part of a different force, an imposing force. So I may well, I may well go down the Castaway Arts route for, um, for the Tuareg, but um, I'm, uh, uh, it's a little bit disappointing with Redoubt that, as I said before, they're not the best of Casts and in the batch that batches that I've been painting, not with any any of these three figures. This is just a good, obviously a guy on a mule, by the way. Um, in case you didn't realise, um, yeah. But a lot of them have got pretty serious um, casting faults. You know, one one is missed a f missing a foot, and another is missing that sort of back uh, pouch cartridge pouch or whatever it is on the back of his belt um, you know so I'm hoping I, I have ordered some of the Legionnaire figures from Castaway Arts as well and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that they're going to be a, a similar size and will fit in and then I might switch to um, switch to them for the Legionnaires as well because again they are you know some of them are advancing but they're, they're all um, there's a lot of reloading and firing figures and things, figures that would be suitable for standing behind the ramparts of uh, Fort Zinternef. So anyway, that's the that's all the figures I have to show you at the moment. I'm working on another batch at the moment. Um, In the background here, you can see little bits of scenic items. So, I've had this building for a long, long time. Um, probably 1990s, sometime in the 1990s I bought it. Um, uh, it's an Ian Weekly uh, model. He, he, um, he used to put up a lot of... Uh, building tips in the hobby magazines um, and uh, then he went on to kind of uh, create a company called Battlements, I said yeah, Battlements and sell uh, figures, not figures, uh, models that he'd uh, you know sort of moulded from his scratch built uh, designs um, so as I say, I've had this a long time, but I was, it it didn't paint up very well. I was never never very happy with the um, the way I painted it. So um, I thought I would try and paint it again and get get the colours to match more with the f model of Fort Zinderdef that I've shown you. And um, it's not far off. It's you know it's not perfect match, but um, it'll fit in on the table quite nicely. Um, I was kind of um, driven to do it, uh, but, but unfortunately I've been let down pretty badly, I have to say, by Adrian's walls now. Um, they, um, they, they do a nice um, Arab village, they do some quite nice Arab Middle Eastern sort of buildings that I've had my eye on for quite a long time because they would fit in with um, the Crusade period that I wore game and would have fitted quite nicely with the Arab Revolt, which I'm, um, you know, it's like a stalled project at the moment, but I am still intending to finish that one day. Um, and now, you know, I was looking for buildings for, um, you know, the, the Foreign Legion in North Africa and thought they would do for that. And I, I put an order in on the 23rd of June and um, got to about the end of July and hadn't hadn't heard anything or received anything, so I got in touch with them. And uh, Adrian uh, of Adrian's Walls apologised profusely 
um, because my order hadn't been processed because of the disruption caused by um, the Covid lockdown and they were just getting back to their workplace when the order came in um, and he promised me um, that, that he would uh, put it onto the casting um, list for the next Monday and have it with me within two weeks and um, it's over over four weeks now and I haven't heard a dicky bird um, so I emailed him again towards the end of last week and haven't had a haven't had a reply yet so I don't know whether he's on holiday but I'm worried now about whether you know it might have got lost in the post rather than uh, been a fault of theirs but I'm, I'm getting a little bit um, worried about it um, so yeah I was looking for you know ways of um, obtaining some buildings and this this one came to mind I mean it's got a nice sort of um, area you know it, it's almost like uh, a kind of casbar like a, a sort of you know group of buildings which are um, you know designed the built of mud but sort of designed partly from the point of view of protection, you know, so they would be along trade routes and highways and things, and then um, camel trains and so on would um, take shelter in them at night, and the, the high walls would protect them from local brigands and so on. So it's, it's almost like that. It's, I, I, you know, ideal. It's not quite on the sky. I, I'm going to show you a picture of a Casbah a little bit later on, but... Um, it's not quite on the scale of the Casbars, but um, it's like a, you know, smaller version. The the one odd thing about it, um, I don't know whether you know, you've it sort of um, struck you, is that all the all the kind of brickwork, the exposed brick mud brickwork, is raised rather than recessed, um, and the flat kind of you know, uh, area surfaces that um, have obviously been you know, washed with a lime or something, um, are deeper than the raised brickwork. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always thought it should be the other way around, surely. Um, but uh, anyway, I think it's a pretty, pretty nice model. Um, don't think you can get it anymore. Um, Ian Weekly passed away quite a long time ago and um, Magister Militum seem to have quite a lot of the old battlements uh, buildings on their website but um, uh, they don't have this one as far as I can tell so um, it's a thing of the past as is that um, that that figure lying behind the dead mule you know it, well it nearly nearly is you know if it doesn't appear on the website then you know who, who's gonna know it's there and yet you know I've, I've sort of had my eye on that for for decades it's one of the reasons why you know, it makes me want to kind of buy figures when I first see them rather than wait, you know, and I build up such a huge lead mountain. Um, and then surrounding the building are lots of um, palm trees, which I got off eBay uh, from a company called Emperor's Toad or a business called Emperor's Toad. Um, uh, I have got some palm trees, but they're a bit um, different in style from one another and so on. So I wanted to get a kind of, you know, homogenous group. And I, and I just like the shape and um, uh, size of these models. Um, they're pretty basic. Um, basically what he does, obviously, is just sort of get sort of plastic kits of these fronds and then assemble them base them and give them a kind of pretty uh, basic kind of, you know, paint job with highlights and things. But the overall effect, I think, is is quite nice. He's, he's, it, you know, they're, they're quite sloppily done. You have to, you know, you have to sort of scrape off bits of the, you know, from the plastic bits of plaster and paint and things that, you know, he's managed to spill onto the, the leaves. You can see the case there. Um, just on the back of the leaf there but that, that comes off pretty easily you just get your nail underneath it and it scrapes off um you know so they're not they're not brilliant but i think as a group they're uh, they work it works quite well and um i've got enough to war game with now um there's one that he obviously didn't uh, didn't notice he hadn't finished and that it's only got 
like one layer of uh, leaves on it um, but you barely notice that and there was another one that came um, it had come unstuck from the base so I just glued it back on uh, but yeah I'm I'm pretty happy with these palm trees I think they you know they look they look pretty good but despite the fact that they're, they're plastic I think they look you know about right nice color in that uh, yeah that's more or less all I've got to show you in terms of um, models and figures and so on um, I have um, just in the last sort of couple of weeks though partly as a result of this uh, issue with Adrian's walls and trying to source model buildings I have been um, contemplating 3D printing you know getting hold of a 3D printer and there's been a couple of um, uh, YouTubers put up uh, videos recently on on the subject uh, walkabout games did one I think it was today or yesterday and paintbrush pirate has just got himself an Elegoo Mars um, really you know really sort of tempted to get one because um, I, I do I'm, I'm really into buildings as you know and um, can never have enough of them I think despite the fact that they uh, they take up a lot of space and um, you know I'm sure it'll be a lot easier to get you know to source buildings just by buying the files in the future than it will be to actually buy them from um, you know buy them direct from manufacturers so I was thinking of that but um, there's a few kind of issues I'm, I, I don't have a lot of confidence about my abilities to use these machines and so on so I thought I might um, go on a course there's there's a course in Plymouth that begins in November um, five week course two hours a week um, you know so it's pretty but it, but it teaches you all the basics about 3d printing and so on so that would be ideal before I um, took the plunge and the, the other thing that's making me pause is that the Elegoo are going to bring out a, a a more advanced 3d printer um, around October November called the Saturn so I have got my eye on that because I think it will be capable of printing kind of larger items like this um, so that's on my mind but then if I if I fork out mon even more money for that then really um, I need to know what I'm doing which is why I need to go on this course but um, the course um, it will take place over the period when I am still booked to go on this holiday to Jordan and I'm just waiting for the Feb. They've offered me the opportunity to postpone it even you know, later to the next April or November but it's getting ridiculous now. If it's November it's over two and a half years since I put the deposit down on it so I just either I want to get it over with really I'm not looking forward to going traveling during this lockdown situation you know I think it's going to detract from my enjoyment of the holiday if I have to hold my hand up to if I want to go to the loo and things like that you know so just ridiculous um, so I'm, I'm waiting for them to kind of say you know that they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to um, you know organize the tour under the current conditions in November and give me my money back rather than putting it off um, but at the moment it's still going ahead in theory and uh, I, therefore I can't book myself onto the 3d printing course um, but there is another course in January anyway that's enough waffles so what I want to do now is um, show you a little bit of reading material and some things I left out unbelievably <laughs> of my um, last really long video okay now I've mentioned uh, this magazine in the past military illustrated I've got every uh, hard physical copy that was ever um, published they, they started in uh, around 1984 and um, ceased publication some time ago now um, 
uh, they did go digital very briefly, but then um, just sort of dried up totally. But um, over the, over the course of the years, the, the quality of the magazine, both the, the physical paper and also the quality of the writing did uh, diminish. But, um, you know, I, I think they're quite a useful resource and I often refer to them. The problem being that um, they were indexed up to... Uh, number 141 and then after that um, you know there was nothing so you had to kind of try and remember where everything was so over the uh, over the lockdown period I uh, applied myself to writing my own index for all the remaining magazines and that's proved to be very useful because I was looking for articles on the Foreign Legion and I found a couple um, this being one of them which is um, an article on the Battle of Bougaffer, which is um, took place in 1933, and it's in a very remote um, part of southern Morocco. Um, and the battle, um, I was talking about the Rif uh, uprising in the 1920s <clears throat> um, last time. Basically, uh, this battle eliminated the final kind of um, group of Berbers who were still uh, recalcitrant and um, didn't want to be uh, under French rule. And um, the it was again you can see you know the kind of terrain that I'm saying this sort of uh, uh, stereotypical idea we have of um, fighting over. Uh, uh, sand dunes and such like it's, it just it doesn't you know it doesn't match the kind of warfare that was going on um, at the time that PC Wren wrote Bojest um, and probably you know as I say the Fort Zindernerf is in a very kind of uh, ludicrous uh, geographical setting I'm going to talk a bit more about that again in a moment, but this is this is the sort of stronghold of uh, I forget the guy's name. Um, yeah, it was the chief of the Ait Atta, and his name was Hassu Bar Salam, and his brother Hamu. Um, they 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 were held up on this really kind of uh, impregnable um, mountain top, and um, it was going to be very costly to um, prize them off of it. And this is another thing that I didn't mention uh, previously, but um, the reason the uh, French Foreign Legion were often given the, the this task, these type of tasks, was that. Um, they were a lot more expendable in terms of French public opinion than, um, you know, sending uh, native Frenchmen to do this kind of work because the casualties were going to be appallingly high. Um, so this battle was um, fought by the Foreign Legion and a large number of uh, native Moroccan troops on the French side, the Goumier and so on. Um, and characters they call partisans and partisan just meant a Berber who was fighting on the side of the French um, but you look, just look at you can see the um, you know the difficulties of fighting over that kind of terrain storming these kind of strong points and in fact um, the attack failed and uh, they starved the Berbers out but basically you know a bit like the siege of Masada uh, the Roman legions fighting against the Hebrews in, in Palestine. They, um, they just basically put a, a ring of camps and defences around and um, the Berbers would come down and um, try and bump sentries off and pilfer ammunition and so on. Um, but it was a losing battle after that point. Um, yeah, the thing about this battle, though, is that it does kind of typify the type of fighting that also took place during the Rift Wars up steep mountain slopes with the um, uh, the Rift, in, the, in that case, you know, sniping at the uh, 
the legionnaires and so on um but it's at, it's kind of outside of what you would uh you know define as the sort of beaugest period um but um this chap here Jean Desmay Bernazel, um, known as the Red Man, um, he was killed during the battle, um, leading uh, some native uh, troops. He was he was an officer commanding um, some of the Goumiers. Um But in the 1920s, um, he was actually an officer of the Spahi. Um, just like the character Henri de Beaujolais in Beaugest. And he, even at that time, he had a very kind of high profile in the Legion, very charismatic uh, character. And it does make you wonder whether, um, you know, uh, PC Wren had Bournazel in mind when he uh, depicts the character of Henri de Beaujolais. Um, and again, sort of, this goes back to... Um, the kind of um, sort of hidden prejudices that are in in Beaujas because um, Ren is almost compelled, partly from the point of view of being able to uh, make the you know make sense of the plot, um, but he's compelled to make Henri de Beaujolais half English. Um, de Beaujolais has an English mother who is an acquaintance of Lady Brandon, so. That links to Beaujolais in with the the Jess and the Brandon Abbas and so on and the mystery of the Blue Water Diamond. Um, so it gives him a link to that. But there's also this sort of um, almost concealed kind of superiority that um, Ren, especially in the Beau Sabreur book, um, Ren is very suggestive of the fact that uh, de Beaujolais' um, uh, character and fortitude and his virtues and so on come from his English half <laughs> rather than his French half um, and also he was educated at Eton so it, it you know it, it, it takes you back to this idea of the sort of social superiority um, that's very kind of uh, obvious in in Beaugest as well. Anyway, yeah, I do wonder. It does make you wonder. But Bernazel, unfortunately, um, he he continued to wear his red cloak, uh, which is why he was known as the Red Man. It was the sort of Spahi uniform, and he continued to wear it even in the 1930s when he was no longer in the Spahi. And the Berbers. Um, believed um, that this cloak had sort of magical properties and that if you fired, if you tried to shoot um, him, the, the bullets would turn around and hit the, hit the shooter. So um, they, they took very few um, pot shots at him and he gained the reputation of, um, you know, in the, amongst the French Legion of being invincible, that he, he was always at the front of the fighting during the Rift Wars and, and later, and never had a scratch, but it was partly the result of this Berber suspicion. But unfortunately, the commander of the uh, French attack on Bougafer ordered him to um, remove his his uh, cloak and wear the appropriate uni uniform. And um, it ended, the inevitable happened, and he ended up being shot. And, and he was hit here. He was. He wasn't killed on that spot. He was wounded and taken back. But died a couple of days, days later. But um, but anyway, um, you know, that is that is another link to Bojess. So, you know, it, it does make you wonder whether, um, you know, de Beaujolais is modelled on Bernazel. And the other article I found um, here is in search of foreign legion forts. Uh, now this is even more relevant um, to what I was talking about last time. Um, a whole article on oh yeah, sorry, before I forget as well, I was talking about the remoteness of of this place, but this is the author Edwin Herbert. Um, he actually went to they trekked to this place. It's like five miles. Um, with four-wheel drive vehicles to get to it, really remote. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, that's another thing. I, was, I said I was going to show you a picture of a Casbar. There is a picture of a Casbar 
Um, so much bigger building than that model. Anyway, let's get on to this other one. Which is an article on um, the finding the Foreign Legion at Forts. And again, this is in Morocco rather than in Algeria. Um, and again, it was uh, the, the writer in this case, is someone called Richard Jones, actually travelled there. They were thinking about organising tours uh, to these forts. And um, he makes a lot of the points that I was trying to, um, you know, sort of make myself and you a lot less effectively about how the forts were generally placed on very high points. They had these large towers because they were they, the, the main the main function of the forts was often the tower itself. It was to get sort of advantageous positions where they could observe um, the surrounding countryside and so on. And um, but he, he also makes a point which I failed to make, which is um, not only did they need uh, materials to build these forts but they they were put up very quickly and the reason they were put up very quickly is because they were often built on very solid um, foundations so they didn't need to actually build foundations because they were built onto to rocky outcrops not onto sand dunes so it's, it's it makes the makes you realize it you know even more how improbable the location of Fort Zindernerf actually was um, and he quotes a lot from Petchkoff, uh, the book that I showed you last time. Um, this is this is uh, the tunnel of the Legionnaires, um, which was I th it built. With, it says built with little or no heavy machinery, um, and it's th th this is another thing that there. It's often these narrow gorges and so on, um, very strategic points that the forts are. Uh, overlooking and um, defending they're not they're not out in the middle of um, vast plains of, of sand dunes um, but the, you know the, a lot of the roads that the legionnaires built and the tunnels that they they dug um, are still the main you know principal kind of routes in in southern Morocco um, uh, sort of you know left that legacy just as the Roman legions left the legacy of their roads that we still use today like like Watlin Street and so on um, yeah so a really good article lots of other little um, you know snippets to enjoy in it um, about everyday the everyday life of the legionnaire and, and he talks about the water supply and having to resupply the forts with water every every week or so um, Something else I meant to say about it, but it's gone, so I'll stop waffling on that and get on to the other uh, book that uh, I've just received in the post today. Okay, this is it. Um, Jack Sarge down in Tasmania um, alerted me to the existence of this book. Um, it's uh, the Foreign Legion uh, and it's published by this company here Heimdall so I ordered this I think it's French French company um, it covers the entire history of the Legion so as I say the uniforms change so much from geographical you know area theater of war and so on um, and time but the period we're interested in this sort of classic Beaugest appearance of the blue overcoat and the white KP and so on um, is covered in, in great detail uh, here we are the Legion of North Africa there we go um, Anthony at Grana Priego actually was reviewing a book Oh, oops, sorry, the camera on the uh, Napoleonic era uh, Imperial Guard, and um, I noticed, and you know, he remarked that uh, this guy Juanu, or Ju yeah, Juanu, I think that's pronounced, um, has illustrated a lot of uh, books on French military uniforms. So he'd done the one that. Uh, 
Anthony Owens on the Imperial Guard and also one on the French Army in the Second World War. Uh, it's very, it is, it's full, it's, you know, there's very little text in here, which is just as well because I'm not brilliant at French, um, but it's full of plates for the entire kind of history up to about conflict in the 1950s, uh, Indochina, you know, Dien Bien Phu and places like that. Um, you know, but earlier still, it's got the Legion in Mexico, and yeah, that's it. I've got, got it at the right page. So this is what I'm saying, that if you were to buy War Games Foundry figures, you know, you'd end up with them uh, powered like this, and it's it, it, it it's not right for the, this very kind of uh, beau geste appearance. Um, so you need to go for ranges where you get this. Um, Ah, yeah, that was the other thing I was going to say on this book. He has got image, uh, images, obviously, for uh, the Rift Wars. Uh, must be going to it in a minute. Here we go. Yeah, Legion Legionnaires of the Rift War. And you can see immediately that they're all in this uh, latter-day kind of khaki coloured uniforms, not the blue overcoats. Um, and this again, it's all part of this blending of the two periods together um, that PC Ran is uh, responsible for because um, the film that I mentioned last time, the March or Die, um, they're all that that is after the after the First World War, um, set in with the conflict against Abdul Al Krim and the and the Rifts, um, and. To be accurate, uh, really, they should be wearing um, this kind of duller uniform, khaki uniform, but they're not. They're all, they're all dressed up um, just like this guy here, you know. So it, it's it's ha it, it's it's just amazing how Wren's work, you know, even a hundred years after it was published, you know, it's still kind of colouring the popular imagination of what the foreign legionnaire should look like and um, the kind of fighting, you know, that in sand dunes that, that supposedly took place. Um, so, you know, it comes across in a lot of popular media now, um, you know, March or Die being an example of that. But anyway, very grateful to Jack Sarge for pointing this book out to me, but I'm going to treasure this and uh, it's going to come in useful for other things as well, like when I get round to eventually painting up a French army for the Crimean War because um, the Foreign Legion served in the Crimea as well and so on. Uh, if I can find it quickly I'll show you. This is the Legion of the Second Empire so I suppose that's the right period. Louis Napoleon. Um, yeah, anyway, that's it. Thanks very much for watching everyone and see you on the next video. Bye for now. Legion will. Legion doesn't get you, and I will. I don't know which is worse.